And so we've been going on this as a series together out of the book of Malachi, talking about a legacy. And so if you want to turn to the book of Malachi, we're in chapter 3. Malachi, in order for you to be able to find it, it's the uh, book of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. So if you go to Matthew, flip back, you'll find the book of Malachi. And God is sharing with Israel the last message he's going to share before he goes silent for 400 years. And this message is really six different messages. God speaks to his people to challenge them in their lives, to live a life that not just impacts themselves, but the people around them and generations to come. It's about living a legacy for God. It is the same message he has declared from Adam and Eve throughout history that through us, God's image would be, would be uh, bore in this world and that we would be fruitful declaring the goodness of God. God created people as the tool to share his glory and goodness in this world. Meaning for us today, we have a choice in our lives and how we, ch- how we desire to live and follow in that path. And in Christ, we can be life-giving, or pri- apart from Christ, we can be life-taking. We can be selfless or selfish. You can be a blessing or a cursing. That God has given you certain blessings as people, whether it be time, talent, gifts, resources, to use it for his glory and demonstrate the ultimate value of who God is by the way you choose to live your life and leave a legacy in this world. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, when God created us, actually starts in verse 26. It says, let us make man in in our image, in the image of God. He made them both male and female. And then he says in verse 28, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. So God makes us in his image. Spiritually, we connect to him as creator God, having the characteristics of God, love, joy, peace, patience. And through that image, we bear that image into this world. And we bless the world by our presence being made known as we walk faithfully with him. Truth is, though, we struggle with that. I mean, that's why we need the body of Christ. And that's why we ultimately need the cross of Christ. That apart from what Jesus has done, we had no hope of ever, ever doing anything that would satisfy God because no good deed we would ever do would satisfy a just and holy God. In fact, the Bible calls that any act that we do apart from Jesus, filthy rags. And so in a very honest way, I've heard a pastor say about us as as people, if you're visiting with us, if you've known the things that we've done in our lives, you wouldn't want to sit with us. But truth is, if we knew the things that you've done in your life, we wouldn't want to sit with you either. By the grace of God, We have hope. And in that hope, because of Christ and giving his life on our behalf, when we were guilty, he bore that guilt and shame. We're made a new creation, able to live in what God has called us to, even in our failures. God makes us new in him, that we, in his image, could be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. And that thought becomes exactly where God is intersecting with the lives of the people of Israel in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. If you remember the backdrop to the story in chapter three, they're saying to God, God, we're good and you're bad. The things that are bad, we're doing and we're calling good. And you, God, who are good, uh, we, we're saying that you are bad. And then God says in Malachi chapter three and verse six, this important statement. And if I could tell you as a church family, out of all that we look at in Malachi, if there is one verse to really hold on to that's significant in your demonstration of Christ in this world, it is this verse. And he says this, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So you remember in this passage, they're saying, God, God, you're, you're bad and we're good. And God is saying in this passage, no, I am good. And the reason you're able to exist in this world is because of the grace of my goodness. You remember through the people of Israel that he's writing or speaking through Malachi, that God has promised through these people that the Messiah would come. And he's saying to them that what you are deserving of because of your unholiness and rejection of God and sin and your violation against holy creator God, Lord of lords, kings of kings, is death. You deserve death. And the reason such a holy God allows you to exist is because of the promise of his grace. 
Israel's upset with God because God's not changing according to their will. God, we're good, you're bad, you need to change. And God's saying, no, I'm good, you're bad, you're the one that needs to change. And it's my promises that demonstrate this how much you need me and, and, and violating against God, how much you don't deserve to exist. But yeah, God, by his grace, allows you to exist. And so this thought of God not changing becomes significantly important in understanding our relationship to God and, and the capability of who God is. Because if God was a God that changed or evolved, it would also communicate that God is inadequate in some way. But yet when you read scripture about God, he contains all things by him. He is. And everything that exists is dependent upon him, not because, because he is adequate, not inadequate. And he does not change, not changing. Does that make sense? <laughs> God does not change. And because of the consistency of him yesterday, we, we in this promise live that he will be consistent that way tomorrow. And because he has declared that promise and his nature is not changing, we always have hope in the grace of who God is because of what he has done. In fact, throughout scripture, the theme of his identity is declared to us so that people who are hopeless, people who are broken, people who are sinful, people who have rejected God can always find hope in the grace of God because he continues to deliver it to us by his gracious hand. Numbers 23, it says this, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind, has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? And showing that Jesus has the same nature, that he is God in the flesh, it says this about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 13. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. His nature is always the same because he is God in the flesh, that God is unchanging. And by unchanging, it means by his nature and character and promises, God is the same. And so in verse seven, and knowing the gracious hand he is delivering to the people of Israel, he says this, for the days of your fathers you have turned aside for my statutes and you have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? And God in this passage is calling them into continual intimacy with him and he's acknowledging that they're, they're repeating the past and they're doing what the, their fathers have done in the past, which is to reject God and turn from him. And they're asking this question almost arrogantly. In fact, in verse 13, it says that they ask their questions arrogantly as if what God's saying isn't accurate. Remember, God is wrong and they are right. And so he, they're saying this, God, how shall we return to you? God, yeah, right. We've never left you. We're your chosen people, right? We're the ones that you love. You love us because we're so lovable. You can't help but do anything but love us. God's saying, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's only because of my nature, which is unchanging, that my love has even been demonstrated to a people who consistently reject me. It's what God has called us to it's to be a light in this world and the salt of the earth. In fact, Jesus continued to put that target before his people that followed him. And in Matthew 5, 13, he says this to us because sometimes our tendency is to get uh, the focus of life all about self and internalize self. And I'm just gonna be honest. Sometimes we like to say things like, um, you know, you don't love yourself enough. But maybe sometimes we just need to consider this. Maybe we love ourselves too much. Maybe that is the problem. And because we love ourselves too much, we continue to look to ourselves as the solution of the problems that we've been experiencing. But, but the Bible tells us that external from us is where hope comes and external from us is where we're transformed and made new. That the answer isn't to look deeper inside of yourself to love yourself more, but the answer is to look outside of yourself to see how much Christ loves you and calls you into this world to be a light for him. And so Jesus, and continue to put that target out there for us, he said this in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. <clears throat> it's getting warmer outside, right? Praise the Lord. <laughs> There's no amens other than one. I mean, cool. It's getting warmer outside, I guess. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> and it's about, to, it's about time to break the barbecues out. Right? And I grill myself some mean corn on that barbecue and put some butter on top and just watch that bad boy melt. When you're from the South, you're really good at butter on everything. <laughs> and you just sprinkle a little salt on the top of that corn. And then you behold the taste. Salt on anything, not too much, but just enough, right? Just draws out that flavor. It is so good. But no one bites something covered in salt. No one's going to bite a piece of corn covered in salt and be like, mmm, that, that salt is fantastic, right? I mean, the whole point of, of biting in, uh, in, using that salt and biting into it is so that the flavor of that thing that the salt is on just radiates, it just pops in your mouth and you enjoy it as it just goes down. You're like, give me another, you can't have enough. It's just dripping off the side. You love it. That salt just brought that taste to the forefront, right? And what God is saying here in this passage is that you are salt. And the point of taking a bite of salt is not to look at you and say, man, you are awesome. But the point of you being the salt is that when people take a bite of your life, they look at you and say, man, Jesus is so good. And that's what it means for your story to live on. Not for people to look at you and think how great you are, but for people to see your life and say, praise God for how great he is. And he's saying in this passage to Israel, this is what I've called you to, that, that you as a nation would be light of the world and people would see you as you savor Christ and they would know that the Lord is good. People longing for the Messiah. And Jesus is a reminder to his people and Matthew having now come as one who would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail, that they would look at the church and in that identity, they would taste and see not that the church itself is good, but their goodness comes because God is good. You know, religious people have the tendency of looking at the world around them and saying, what's wrong with those people? Ew. God's people, because they understand the grace that's been given to them and the goodness of who Jesus is, they look at the world and they say, God, how? How could we make you known? Just as you've met me on, on a crossroads in relationship with you because of what you've done, Lord, how can we continue to be used as a tool in the environment of the people around me that they could see and see demonstrated through my life the goodness of who you are? which I would say is living life successfully. And so Israel's accusation in, in these chapters, verse six and seven, God, how can, how can we return to you, Lord? It, we're not leaving you. We're, we're your chosen people. You love us because we're special. And then God says this. Well, a man robbed God. Uh, being a pastor, I feel like it's important here to interject this thought. Don't rob God. <laughs> That's probably good advice I can give you today. Uh, this is not a good thing. Uh, if you're going to rob someone, rob someone less than God. <laughs> don't, don't rob anybody, okay? Don't rob anybody, but definitely don't rob God. Will a man rob God, yet you're robbing me? But you say, how have we robbed you, God? We're special, right? And then he says this, and tithes and offerings. You know, I think in this passage, God could have pointed to anything and said, here, you want an example? But, but for Israel in this passage, I think he points to the most tangible example for everybody. Because if you remember the history of where Malachi fits in, the, the people of Israel were in captivity in Babylon. For 70 years, they're in captivity. They find themselves released and their desire is to then go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to rebuild this, the, the place in which God had called them the place where God's presence was. And they go into this temple and, and shortly thereafter, they begin to, to wane in what they pursued and the reason they left Babylon altogether. And, and they start to neglect the place where God's presence was, which was at the temple. 
And so God says, you want a tangible example? Look to the temple where my presence is. And in that temple, he uses this place called tithes and offerings because in that temple, there were these storerooms or storehouses where they would come, they would offer things, they would, they would put them in the, the offerings in the storehouses and it was a way to praise God. But those, those things within the storehouses were also used in other capacities, but they would take it there, they would deliver it there as a worship and an offering before God, demonstrating the worth they believed God had in their lives, their times, talents, resources, gifts to the praise of God. And now this sacred place where the Shekinah glory, the presence of God dwell. It's empty. Now, sometimes I think we can fool ourselves this way as people. I'm a good person, right? I, I do good things. Israel could say this before God. God, I'm a good person. I do good things. And God says, oh, really? Here's an example. The very place my presence dwells. Look, Israel. It's been neglected. For us in our lives, we could ask that question in multiple different ways. God could have pointed to multiple different things for Israel, but I think because of the tangible identity of the temple and what it represented in the presence of God being empty, it was the it was the most heart wrenching thing that God could point out to. It was the reason they left the captivity. But in our own lives, the question is, is, the, is Jesus emanating from who we are? Is the purpose for which we live is for people to think we're good or God is good? I mean, when's the last time you invited someone to his community? When's the last time you encouraged your family close to the Lord or ministered to your children or sat down and read God's word together? I mean, it's hard to say that Jesus is the most important thing to your life if the, the answer to that is none. I haven't. And, and that's what God is pointing Israel to here. The most important thing for the history of Israel was the temple. They, when they would set up their camp, the temple was in, in the wilderness. When they wandered, the temple was the center of the camp. Everything they did pointed to this place because it was considered sacred, because the presence of God was there, but yet they neglected. Why? Because they began to look at the time and the talents and the gifts and the resources that God gave them as belonging to them and they're saying to God, God, if you want things, you can go get it yourself. But the problem with that thinking is how we view the time, talents, gifts, resources that God gives us. Because when you consider what the Bible says about those things, in Psalm chapter 24 and verse 1, it says this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So whatever you possess in this world, whatever your talents, gifts, times, money, resource, whatever it is that you think that you own, it's not true. <laughs> God owns it all. And when the pursuit of our life becomes about attaining more of those things, it's important in a sober mentality to recognize in our lives the more that you possess the more responsible you are for the things that you have. There is an accountability to all of it because all of it belongs to the Lord. Everything God has created is intended to be used for his glory. But the way that you use it demonstrates what glory it really goes to. And when it's not for God's glory, there's accountability with it. Time, talent, resources, it all belongs to God. God is the owner of all of it. And God is saying to Israel in this passage that the place where my, my presence is most made known, that in itself should be the very place at least one could look to see how people are lavishing uh, on me and demonstrating my glory if they find me so valuable. And so the question then is if, if, if God truly owns everything, yet he allows these things to pass through my hands and I, I'm not really truly the owner of any of those things, how does the Bible call me to view the stuff that I have, time, talents, resources, whatever it is? And, and the answer is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. It says this, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust or stewardship must prove faithful. 
that you have become the steward of the things in which God owns. That God has given you certain things in life to demonstrate and allow the, the glory of God to emanate from your life through those resources. And when Malachi uses this in Israel as an illustration, he uses in verse 10 the idea of tithes and offerings. Excuse me, verse 8. Tithes and offerings. This word for tithe is the Hebrew word for 10 or where we get the thought of 10%. The Old Testament practice of Israel was when they went to the temple to give a 10, 10% to the temple of what uh, they had before the Lord. But this wasn't the only offerings Israel gave. In fact, when you study the history of the giving that God required of Israel, somewhere between 20 to 25% of what they possessed went to God in worship out of different tithes and offerings they were called to, to give to the Lord. Even before the Old Testament law, Abraham Mel uh, gave to Melchizedek a tenth. Jacob gave a tenth. And so 10% was uh, the Old Testament practice. But here's what's important to know about tithes and offerings. If you ever wonder when it comes to resources financially and giving to God, what's a good number? Um, if, if you've weighed that in your head, the, the word tithe is an Old Testament word. Meaning in the New Testament, there is no calling of giving a tithe. And so for me to tell you that it's biblical to give 10%, I would say yes in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's not there. Right? I'm not just kidding. So what does God call us to give? The Bible never gives an, an answer to a numeric number. I think 10% is maybe a good arbitrary number, but... Um, it, because it's, it follows what the Old Testament was, but the Bible never gives us a number. But when you read it in the New Testament, when you read what the church did in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, they were giving unconditionally, sacrificially. They wanted to give in such a way that Jesus was their pursuit and joy in life. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and talking about at the church, this is what Paul said. He said, now concerning the collection for the saints... As I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. So in the very beginning, on, on Sunday, the church was, would gather, the first day of the week, the church would gather and they would take a collection in order to give towards the, the, the glory of God being made known, that the community continued to propagate the gospel and share and to see lives transformed in Christ. You know, there's no specific way that's designated in the Bible as to how to take an offering on Sunday morning. There's no mandate that we have to take an offering on Sunday morning. In fact, Paul just encouraged the body of believers here to do that because it's, it seems like a decent time when God's people are gathered to promote his name to do it then. And so they would take an offering and different churches do it in different ways. And by the way, I'm talking about finances to some degree today. So if you're uncomfortable with that, I apologize. I'm uncomfortable with it too. So there you go. But when you take an offering on Sunday morning, churches do it differently. We've done it differently in our past. We've, told, we've had offering boxes and said, if you want to give, give there. And now we do offering baskets. And the reason we've changed to offering baskets is that during our worship when we're honoring God, we want that to pass before seed so that if, if you want to have a sacred moment before the Lord in order to give to him, to show uh, your glory and uh, his glory and worth, to demonstrate that from your life as you're worshiping him with God's people, that you have the opportunity to do that. And if you don't like doing that and you want a box, there's boxes, whatever. But the point of all of it is in our lives, we understand that God's given us time, gifts, talents, and resources to glorify his name, to show in life that he is our prize and our joy. In fact, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3 and in, in, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, it tells us not to allow the love of money to control us, but what, what does uh, dictate our lives is the love that we carry for the Lord. And so it shares that with us in Scripture. Paul, when he describes giving, if you want to look it up later, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 talks about grace giving. Jesus in Luke chapter 11 and verse 42, he, he rebuked the religious leaders of his day when they were giving 10%. In, in fact, the Pharisees would give, they would tithe even portions from their own table. 10% as the law had declared them to do. And in Luke chapter 11 and verse 42, Jesus rebukes those leaders because the motivation for which they were doing it was to look good before others. 
but not out of love for God. It's the motivation behind anything that you do for the Lord. It's not guilt. Today, it's, it's not about guilt. It's an overflowing out of your love for Jesus and a desire to want to demonstrate that in the way that you live your life. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 9, it goes on and says this, you are cursed with a curse, talking about them for not giving. You're cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me on this. Look, in verse 10, pay attention to this. God says, test me on this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you. So that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the fields cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. I'm going to come back to verse 10. What verse 10 is not saying for us today is if you give to Jesus, you'll own a Mercedes tomorrow. That is not what it's saying, okay? God may call us in this world into suffering. In fact, Jesus and his apostles lived lives of destitute to declare his glory. So just because you serve Jesus does not mean you're going to live life wealthy, But in verse 10, I think he's saying something specific I'm going to come back to in a moment. But what he's recognizing in the theme of these verses is when our hearts become selfish and we become self-absorbed and we use the things that God has given us to promote ourselves, the people that truly suffer in that isn't, it's not God. It's you. It's you and the people around you. That's why I said in the beginning, if God's story as it intersects our lives, ends with us, it is a tragedy. Because the greatest gift I think that we can experience in our lives is how we walk with Jesus and seeing how through us God uses us to transform the life around us. The person that's most blessed in any of that isn't the person that's receiving, it's the person that's giving. You'll find if you in your life ever take a missions trip anywhere to serve the Lord, you'll go thinking that you're going to serve the people there, but what you find in serving the people there is that you're the one that's most blessed out of that journey. I think it's like that when you serve Jesus anywhere. Can I tell you how I robbed you today? I had the opportunity to sit down and really dig into God's word over this topic, and you're just hearing the overflow from that. I spent hours in God's word this week because of this message. I am blessed most because of it. Serving God. He's saying in this passage, through the context, when we neglect to serve God, we're thinking that we're keeping things from God for our own benefit, but the one that suffers from that is the one who's created to reflect the goodness of God in this world. And so he's reminding Israel of this passage, not only are you robbing yourself, you're robbing those around you, and you're robbing other people, groups, or nations. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. And so we rob ourselves of demonstrating the glory of God and the worth of our God above all else. We rob ourselves of ridding ourselves from all other idols to demonstrate what we truly love in Christ. So they call us, we give because we love God. And we want to make him known. And giving is a tangible way we demonstrate of what we love more possessions or Jesus. In our culture today, it is, po- it, is, it is popular to rail against the trajectory of our nation, to protest, to use words of aggravation. You know, I wish as much as people complained that those same people would be the people that would do something to demonstrate where ultimate change happens in Christ. And when you read about this in, in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 13 and verse 10, this, this context of this verse is happening the same time as the story of Malachi. Nehemiah is one of the leaders of Israel who's going back as, as the people are, are building the temple. And this is what he says about the people. They, they wanted to see the temple built. And they wanted to see God praised again. They thought about all these glorious things. And then he reflects back on where they are in this present condition. And he says this, I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them so that the Levites and the singers who performed the services had gone away. This is talking about in the temple, each to his own field. 
what it's saying is, as the people of Israel would go to the temple and they would make these sacrifices, that a portion of what they would use for those sacrifices would be given to the Levites who worked in the temple. And it would provide for their families. And because the people really weren't sold out for the Lord, what was happening is the Levites who were going to the temple weren't able to eat, and so they had to return, and so the temple was left empty. And so the people that proclaimed that God was so important, the the proclamation of that was not being passed to that generation or future generations. And so they may complain about the desire to want to see change in the world around them, but they were doing nothing to contribute to that cause. And so Nehemiah is saying to the people, Lord, if you want to pursue God, if you want to see God change things, if you want to see God's glory made known, then become a part of the people that give to the cause that God's glory may be given and promoted throughout this world. You are plan A. There is no plan B. So let me have an awkward conversation for a moment. Because today we don't give to Levites and priests anymore. We don't have the temple anymore because we have become the temple of God. The temple isn't a physical building. The temple is God's people. God's presence dwells within his people. And so that way of thinking isn't, doesn't fit in the context of where we are. But what the New Testament calls in, in leadership is the elders and the pastors. And it uses those terms, bishops, presbyters, as, as the leaders of the church. In different churches, they use different terms. And I know sometimes it becomes the, the thing to talk about paying pastors. And so let me, let me share a thought on paying pastors for a minute, not because I'm looking for a bigger paycheck, okay? You guys should know that's not my motivation in saying this at all. I'm not going to open up any offering plate later and say, give me your cash into your wallet. None of that's going to happen. If you've been um, to ABC for any amount of time, you know what it's taken for us to get to this place. Um, for the first six years our church existed, I, I worked other jobs. Uh, I didn't take money from the church. I didn't have a paycheck from the church. If it's not godly to take a paycheck from the church, I would not be accepting a paycheck from a church. Um, I I lived on $30,000 or less a year for like the first eight years. I lived in Utah, which I don't know how that happened, but somehow it did. So I, I'm not, I didn't get into this for the money. Uh, this is not the career to choose if you're interested in money. Like, this, is, this is the worst option for, for that. You gotta really want your, your heavenly rewards than your, your earthly rewards. So that's my motivation. And, 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 and my motivation in sharing this has nothing to do with me. But let me share this on, a, on, a, on another note. I know not everyone here today will always be a part of ABC. At some point, God may lead you to other places. You may move, you may get a promotion, you may be, be in a different spot. So for the sake of whoever might be on staff, maybe I'm sharing this for them today, I don't know. But in the New Testament, there's biblical thoughts on paying people for ministry within the church. When a church gets past 70 to 80 people, it really becomes impossible for for uh, people to take care of the body of Christ. And so it becomes necessary to, I think, employ people once a church definitely gets above that. Some churches can employ people before that. And if they're able to, then that's great for the church. I think it's healthy for the church to be able to have someone. Because if we don't, we're gonna end up with Nehemiah 13.10. But if you look in the New Testament for passages that talk about uh, paying people in salary, just so you know where they are, they exist. There are several. The most popular one is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to tell you as I read this, I don't know of any religion in the world that doesn't pay their leadership something, no matter how much people might want to proclaim. They don't. They do. And so 1 Corinthians 9, though, is where we go for the New Testament. And this is the most prominent one, the most descriptive one. It actually starts before verse 10, if you ever want to go back and read this. But this is Paul writing to the Corinthians. The reason he's having to write this to the Corinthians is because the Corinthians are the worst demonstration of what a church is. If you read 1 and 2 Corinthians... As you read that, just know whatever they're doing, I do not want to do, all right? And Paul's writing this to them because they're doing what they should not do. And he says this, though. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, 10, or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written, talking about someone proclaiming God's word, because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not mourn? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share 
from the altar. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. I can't make it any more clear than that. So verse 14, that's what Paul, he's laying that out. I'll get to 15 in a second, but he's saying it, it is, um, if, if it's possible and the, someone ministering for the gospel can make a living from the gospel, then do that. That way they have more time to proclaim the gospel. Just so you know, on a personal level, from a, from a pastoral standpoint, people that serve the church, I know a lot of us serve the church. We work full time and serve the church here, which I'm grateful for and thankful for. We don't have the capacity to pay people. Utah is the poorest church in, in the nation. When it comes to serving in a pastoral role here, I can tell you when it, uh, sermons, like on Sunday, I do not write sermons between nine to five. I, there is no time for me to write sermons nine to five. I know some people might think I only work on Sundays, that is, that if, I, if you come here after the service, I want to give you a swift kick. No, I'm just kidding. That is not, that is not how it goes. If sermons are written after the kids go to bed, late at night, hoping to, hoping to the Lord you get through with this one so you got something to show up on, with on Sunday to make it worthwhile for the people to come and worship God together. That's, that's generally how it happens. I like to do it ahead of time just so I'm not last minute crammed to do those things, but some weeks are so jam-packed that it becomes impossible. But Paul says here in the verse 14, if it's possible to allow the minister to make a living from the gospel. So for whatever pastor you're with in the future, I'm not crying, I'm not complaining. I, I feel, I love where I'm at in life and I'm enjoying life as it is. But, but wherever you're, you're at, that's biblical. But then Paul says this in verse 15. But I have used none of these things. So Paul says, I'm not taking a paycheck. And I am not writing these things so that I will be done so, in, so it will be done in my case. Like I'm, and I'm not looking for one. For it would be better for me to die than to have any man make my boast any, em any empty one. So he's saying, I really want to show you my passion is Jesus. And so I'm not doing this for monetary gain. I, I did, it, did that for as long as I could here at ABC on a, on a personal level. Paul, by the way, if you're wondering, in Corinth was there for 18 months. 18 months he served there and he was a, a, a tent maker, made money uh, part of the time. And so people could take this verse and see like, see, Paul didn't pay, take a paycheck, therefore you shouldn't pastor. Which I'll say, okay, fine, go, go find someone that will do it for less than this, okay? Because they, 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 it's not possible. But, but this is what Paul says. This is, this is what Paul goes on to tell the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11, 8. He says this, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. So for us today, I think it's even important to acknowledge the reason ABC exists is not because of our generosity. Now, I, I wanna tell you that as you felt the Lord live in your life and you are giving, that does help us to continue to exist. I, I am grateful for any, anyone that, that gives to the Lord in any capacity, in any way. Time, talents, gifts, resources, whatever. I'm thankful for that. But the reason ABC exists is for the same reason Paul says. Other churches. I know some of us have donated even to have this building, but I want you to know the majority of the money that it took to get in this building, over $200,000, didn't come from our church. It came from other churches. God intersected in their lives. And their desire was to see the glory of God be made known. And they demonstrated that by not only giving to where they were, but giving beyond that. And now it comes to us for the same opportunity that that story wouldn't die with us, but it would intersect in our lives and his glory would continue to be made known, both here locally and abroad. And my encouragement to us as a church is to continue to think about how God could do that in us and through us, in, excuse me, in our lives. You think of because of what God has done through other churches and seeing a work started here that this church is now beginning to grow and establish itself. And even from this now, we've even started works in other countries that even last year that we went on a mission trip to India and through the donations of that trip and through regular donations that come through monthly, $13,000 was given to that ministry. I'm not saying that's enough. I'm saying we need not stop to continue to reflect the goodness of God in the world in which we live in. Malachi chapter three, verse 10, it says, God says this, test me and see how the floodgates would open. And I think God is saying to Israel, the promise that he gave to them in the Old Testament, that if you're faithful to me, I'll bless you. If you disobey me, you will be cursed. Now we don't live under the Old Testament law anymore, but, but a principle to that thought still applies here in 2 Corinthians 9. It says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly, will reap sparingly. 
And whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work as it is written. So when we are a generous people, we're a blessed people. We have the ability to proclaim his name and have a place to meet and a light that's shed into this world. Can I tell you the most exciting thing for church? When God's people see the effect they're having on the community around them. Evangelism, honestly, evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. When we see here in this community people coming and becoming a part of what God is doing, that gets us excited to continue on that cause. In life, it breeds more life, and people are attracted to life, and they want to be a part of something that's life-giving. I mean, we're doing Volunteer Sunday today, and you being a part of that, that's why it's so important that you come and you give and you serve and you promote the life that is God's people in the church as God works through our heart. Amen. (laughs) You guys are alive, right? All right, let me give this last thought. Malachi chapter 3, verse 12, he also says this, that it affects the nations. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land. So he's saying when, when God's people test him and they give and the nations see the glory of God being made known in the people of Israel, that they bless God because of that. But I kind of tell you, it's the same thing here. That God now calls his people into the nations. And when they see God's people living for his glory, it's a blessing to the nations and the nations are affected by that. It's saying in our giving of our time, resources, talents, abilities, whatever, that God is great and stuff doesn't own me, but rather I would, I would have a, a greater hope in God and my life is demonstrating a true trust and worth in God and my family and my church and my community is blessed because of that and the world around me is blessed because of that. It's statistically said that less than 2% of what a church gives towards missions goes to the unreached people group of the world, which is today 2 billion people in this world. 2% of what they give towards missions goes to 2 billion people. Unreached people groups is a population that's considered less than 2% Christian, of which I want you to know this morning, that's Utah. How important. How important that you love Jesus. I'm not asking you to fabricate this. I'm not saying to you this morning, try harder. I'm saying to you this morning, love Jesus. Love Jesus because he does not change. Love Jesus because he has given everything for you. Love Jesus because time is short and God has given you the opportunity and what little time you have in this world to promote the goodness of his glory to the people around you. Love Jesus with all that you are, everything that God has given. Let Jesus have control of that because the people around you need it so desperately. Love Jesus not out of guilt, but out of joy out of joy for what he has done, joyfully demonstrate that in the world. And from that joy, let the world see how good God is. Love Jesus. And from the love of that relationship, and let the goodness of God flow. William Carey was a missionary to India. And it took him a while to get to India because the part of the world in which he lived in, the church people that were there believed that they didn't need to go anywhere for the cause of Christ, even though God created them to be a light to the world. Their thought was, God, if God cared about them, God would take care of them. William Carey began to open up scriptures and to teach the church that what God calls as the one, as the, the ability to take care of people are the people made in his image. They are the mouthpiece to point people to Jesus because they understand what Jesus can do. And so we spent time promoting that. And eventually the church where he lives decides that he needs to go somewhere and, and share that. And so they send him to India. And this is what he said about his life. I am not afraid of failure, but rather I'm afraid at succeeding in the things that do not matter. Can I tell you, when we hold on to things, 
even though made in God's image, as if they belong to us, as if it's going to get us somewhere. We're living for things that don't matter. But church, let's just be thankful. Thankful for what God's done here, what God continues to do here, and what God will continue to do through us as we look to him as our prize.